My name is Clay Sizemore. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, I'm one of the interventional cardiologists here at Archibald. Uh, by way of my background, I went to medical school at the University of Florida, spent three years in internal medicine residency at the University of Virginia, came back to Gainesville to do three years of cardiology, and then did a year of interventional cardiology, peripheral vascular intervention, uh, also at Shands. Uh, practiced for a couple of few years in Central Florida and, have, and happy to say I've now been in Thomasville for about four years um, and love it. So with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and just jump right in. Very casual talk tonight. Are we getting a lot of feedback? <clears throat> um, it's going to be very casual. So you guys raise hands, throw food, ask questions. We'll stop and talk anytime. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is is leg pain, but the talk's not just about legs. It's, and that's that's uh, very important, and we're going to talk about how we treat that leg pain, but well, I want you to, um, to, to leave with something more than just that. Okay, so th just by way of overview, we're going to talk about peripheral arterial disease. We're, we'll just kind of define that, help you understand what it is, what it feels like, how we diagnose it, how it's treated, and then we're going to move on to the last little bit to talk about why that's important to you beyond just symptoms that it might be giving you. Um, so we'll just jump right in. So what is PAD, or peripheral arterial disease? Um, it is the process of atherosclerosis, which is, in more lay terms, the gradual buildup of fatty and calcified plaques in the arterial wall. Um, it can involve any artery in your body. We'll talk more about that. Uh, what ultimately happens is as that plaque progresses, it, you can develop blockages which restrict blood flow. In the case of PAD, it restricts blood flow to the extremities, uh, the lower extremities in particular. That restriction leads to inadequate oxygen delivery to your tissues. Your tissues need oxygen to function and uh, to survive. And ultimately, that lack of oxygen is what causes discomfort. And in the cases of very severe restrictions in oxygenation, uh, pro simple processes like healing wounds uh, can be interrupted. This is just a, a kind of a visual. Um, one thing that I, you probably can't see from back there, but this is a timeline. And we see that fatty streaks and plaque begins as early as the third decade. One of the ways we know that actually is in the men who served in Vietnam, who we lost, they, many of them were in, involved in uh, autopsy studies that were to help us learn how to better take care of our wounded in the field and things like that. And we learned that in their aortas, they actually had plaques. In young men, 20 and 30 year old men, had atherosclerotic plaques. Um, so it starts very early. This is kind of the end stage when plaques become larger and larger and less and less stable and you'll see here uh, at the point of end-stage disease when events start happening is when those plaques rupture and they can develop clots. So by way of background on PAD it's very common. You can see that by the time you're fortunate enough to be 80 years old you've got about a one in five chance of having it. Um, it's a little more prevalent in men than women but not a lot. So it's very very common. What we don't really know is all the people who don't have symptoms and who go undiagnosed. So we know there's, six, there's over six million people in Europe and the United States that have peripheral arterial disease. What we are less sure about are all these people who have not yet had the diagnosis made, who are walking around with leg pain and think it's just because they're getting older or um, don't have the resources or ability to get to see someone. So the leg pain, we're that's a great question. That, that's a good entree. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that in just a second. Um, the risk factors for developing peripheral arterial disease are similar to the traditional risk factors of all of, for heart disease and, and cardiovascular disease in general. High blood pressure, high cholesterol, family history of strokes or heart attacks. Uh, again, age, it's very closely linked to age. Um, in particular, age, diabetes, and this is a smoker's disease also. So you can certainly have it without having ever smoked, but it is very much more likely if you do smoke. So what are the symptoms? So stable peripheral arterial disease can, can, can be completely asymptomatic. 
So you don't have to have leg pain. You can have blockage in the major arteries of the legs without any symptoms at all. And probably the majority of people don't have symptoms. And that's one of the reasons why we're going to talk to you tonight about the free screenings that we have. Um, because it's still important to know that you have it, even though it's not causing you any problems. The most common symptom is called intermittent claudication. That's just a clinical term for pain in the muscles of the legs, usually the calves or thighs, that gets better when you rest. Okay, that's, that is the classic symptom. Um, there are, though, frequently atypical symptoms. These uh, can include a wide variety of things, including numbness or weakness, coldness. I have patients that tell me it feels like I'm dragging dead weight. Um, uh, so we, we try to not tell people just because you don't have pain specifically that, that, that you don't have peripheral arterial disease. Like a lot of diseases, it's, it's very individualized and people have different kinds of pain. Um, at the very end stage of the disease when the tissue has been deprived of oxygen for a long, long time, you can actually develop a neuropathy that's like diabetic neuropathy where the, the, the feet, the soles of the feet burn and sting and tingle and become numb. So it's kind of a broad spectrum. Does that answer your question about the pain? It's generally not. I'll tell you, the pain that, it, that happens to people's legs that's not usually vascular is joint pain. So arthritis is a common cause of pain in older folks, include, and that can be in the hip or the knees or the ankles. And that generally is not a vascular pain. Now, it, it, when you have diffuse pain, it's sometimes hard to localize. So Again, we try to not uh, make generalizations, but that's kind of how the pain is. Other things that you can see besides pain and atypical symptoms is loss of hair on the distal extremities. You can see the nails will change. You have an increased risk of developing fungal problems with the nails. That's also called onychomycosis, where they become thick and brittle or yellow and you have to put stuff on them. Uh, the skin color can change. You can get a bluish discoloration of the legs. Um, and then the muscles over time will also atrophy some. <clears throat> For critical limb ischemia, so now we're moving from stable peripheral arterial disease to critical limb ischemia, we start seeing things like rest pain. So the kind of classic description is, Doc, my feet are killing me when I'm laying in bed at night. The sheets on my toes. It, a lot like what a, someone with bad gout would say, the sheets on my feet really hurt me and I have to hang my leg over the side of the bed and that makes it better. And that's because the gravity is actually helping the circulation and pulling the blood down into the foot. So rest pain is a very dangerous thing. Um, slow or non-healing wounds. You know, we all remember when, when we were young, you kind of get a wound, you put a band out on it, it heals over the course of a couple of few days. When you have wounds on your feet, particularly if you have diabetes or risk factors, and they're not getting better over the course of a couple of few weeks, we need to start kind of asking questions like, maybe are we not circulating enough you know, blood and oxygen down there to heal them adequately? So those, by definition, uh, represent critical limb ischemia, and that is, to, and to a variable degree, potentially an emergency. Um, so we've got a little mnemonic that you can keep in mind for, for what really, what, what those of us who do vascular intervention or vascular surgery um, teach students and residents to keep in mind so they can remember the five things you just don't want to miss, things that really represent a surgical emergency. So the first is pain, obviously we've talked about that. Pallor, so a blue or, or pale foot. <coughs> Pulseless foot. So if you lose the pulse on the top of your foot or behind your ankle, that's, a, that's one of the five. Paresthesias is the clinical term for tingling, you know, when your arm goes to sleep or you hit your funny bone. When you start getting those kind of symptoms. And paralysis. So if we start to lose motor function, that's a really bad sign. Those are all things that need urgent medical attention, um, by a, potentially by a vascular specialist. So how do we diagnose peripheral arterial disease? There are a, a, a variety of tests. The basic preliminary test, non-invasive test, is called an ABI. And that stands for ankle brachial index. And that's as simple as taking a blood pressure in the arm and a blood pressure in the ankle and seeing if there's a difference. And that sort of makes intuitive sense. So if you have a normal blood pressure here and a really low blood pressure down here, 
there's obviously something wrong because you're supposed to have the same perfusion pressure throughout your body. Um, we nowadays use uh, special Doppler tools to get a real sensitive blood pressure. And these are just those ratios. So again, normal is, they, they should be about the same. Sometimes they're a little higher in the legs because of gravity and because of uh, other reasons that aren't worth going into. But when they start dipping down below 0 0.9, then we start worrying that that's, that's indicative of peripheral arterial disease. This is a very preliminary test. It doesn't tell us where the blockages are or give us an idea of the percentage severity, but it, it can tell us that maybe we need to do something else to look for it. The next step, once you have an abnormal ABI, is to possibly do some imaging. We have not invasive and non-invasive imaging. These are examples of, on the left, this is a reconstructed CT scan, and this is an MRI. Um, you can see we get some really nice pictures with the current technology. Uh, there are limitations to this. Calcium, in particular, which occurs very frequently in folks who are over 55 or 60 years old, uh, can inhibit our ability to interpret scans. Kidney function can prevent us from being able to give folks dye. Um, so this is not for everybody. We also use catheter-based angiography, and this is an invasive procedure that we do in the cardiac cath lab. Um, it's very much like a heart catheterization where we access the femoral artery or possibly the radial artery and slide a catheter in there and inject contrast and take pictures with an x-ray camera. Uh, <clears throat> some of the benefits of a catheter-based angiogram uh, are that it's the highest possible resolution. So we kind of get a crisper, cleaner picture. We get a little better visualization. We can um, do focused examinations, take additional pictures with different angles and zoom in and zoom out and do some, do some things that help us get a better idea as to uh, how bad a diseased segment is. We can also do some other tricks like looking at an ultrasound from the inside out and measuring pressure gradients and, and things that give us a better idea as to physiologically how bad a, a blockage is. Um, the other thing is that it, it also allows us to then frequently at that same, in that same setting fix whatever blockage we find. So the catheter-based angiography tends to be kind of the gold standard or the kind of the final thing to, to make a diagnosis and ultimately lead to treatment. So that, yes ma'am? Is the catheter inserted in the groin? So her question was, is the catheter inserted into the groin? And most of the time when we're talking about lower extremity disease, particularly if we're going to try and fix something, the answer is yes. Uh, Sometimes we will be doing other procedures like a heart catheterization at the same time. Um, and in, in those instances, uh, we can access the radial artery like we do most of our heart caths now. If we aren't sure which leg is worse and we want to not commit to which side we're going to work from, then sometimes we'll also access the radial artery. So the answer is we can access just about any artery and get to where we need to get to. But in terms of fixing things, usually our equipment is set up best for femoral access. <clears throat> so in, moving on to treatment. Um, when we find blockages and they're symptomatic, and let me back up and say, not all blockage needs to be treated. In fact, we have numerous patients that have blockage that doesn't quite interfere with their lifestyle, that doesn't quite bother them enough to make it worth doing anything about it, and lower extremity peripheral arterial disease is not something that, generally speaking, if you don't have wounds or something else critical going on, it's not something that's going to shorten your life per se in and of itself. We'll elaborate that more on at the end, um, but I would be remiss if I didn't say a lot of the folks that I take care of that have peripheral arterial disease, peripheral arterial disease we never even take them to the cath lab. Or we take them to the cath lab and take pictures and never fix them. Um, so. Uh, I want to be clear, not everybody has to be fixed. Um, for people who are unhappy with their quality of life and are having problems as a result of their peripheral arterial disease, can, there, there are treatment options. And those start for, kind of from simple to more complex uh, with things like balloon angioplasty to atherectomy, which I'm going to show you a little animation of, um, and in cases when there's no other options, stenting. We try to stay towards the top of that, um, 
the top of that spectrum because once we get into things like stinting where we're putting permanent equipment in there, we start to lose options. We like to save the more complicated things for future uh, episodes. One thing that I have to admit to you is that the technology is still in rapid evolution. We are not where we want to be in terms of blockages staying fixed. We have uh, a fairly decent or fairly high recurrence rate um, depending on what kind of procedure you have and what kind of <coughs> complexity your disease represents. Um, but for those reasons, since we know there's a decent chance that down the road in the next year or a few years you might need another procedure, we try and save um, some of those more complicated uh, things uh, down the road. So let's look a little closer. This is just a little animation. This is actually a coronary balloon, but it kind of serves the purpose. Um, this is a this, so the representative artery, there's a wire that gets advanced beyond the occlusion and a little uh, plastic balloon gets inflated at very high pressure and smashes the plaque out of the way. And generally speaking, the plaque will, will push back into the arterial wall and smooth out. And if we're lucky, that it, we're just done and we can just stop with that. And, um, but that's not always the case and we have to kind of move down that, that ladder. This is going to be a little bit of an animation. Um, Todd, can you guys see that okay? Are the lights all right for seeing that? So this is called orbital atherectomy. And similarly to the other procedure, you, we advance a wire down into the uh, distal part of the vessel and we can put this, for lack of a better term, drill bit. It's kind of an offset drill bit that, uh, on that wire and it spins at several thousand revolutions per minute and it has a, it's dusted with kind of fine diamond uh, chips to create a sanding type device and it slowly atherectomizes that plaque and kind of disintegrates it into tiny particulate. Now they, the question is where does all that go? Does it kind of go downstream and plug up the artery? <laughs> and the answer is they've actually designed it in such a way it spins so fast and that the, the, the coating on the drill bit is so, is, is designed in such a way that the micro particulate is so small that it fits all the way through capillaries and goes down through the arteries into the capillary bed, into the veins, back to the liver and gets cycled out of the body. So. Um, doesn't always work that way, obviously, but that's the way it was designed to work. And it's another tool that we have to try and help us avoid putting in stents so that we can save stents for the future. This is a, just another version of an atherectomy device um, that's pretty slick. There's your wire across your plaque. And you'll notice right at the end of this this is a storage unit. A little blade is going to slide out and that's a spinning disc, very sharp kind of spinning disc that spins and carves the plaque as you advance the catheter and instead of sending it downstream it actually stores it in this uh, chamber and plunges it forward to make room for more. And then sometimes after both of those procedures, we'll do a little bit of light balloon angioplasty or touch up, touch up work. But uh, um, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. So then, in, in the case where we really just can't get a good enough result with balloon angioplasty and atherectomy, we will do stents. This is an example of a balloon expanding a spandle stent. It's just a mesh, wire mesh tube that's crimped down on a balloon, and when we deploy the same balloon, that wire mesh stays behind and holds the plaque open, the balloon comes out. We've also got stents that are uh, kind of uh, self-expanding, we just, we unsheath them and they expand to fit the wall exactly. Yes, sir? What happens to the particles that are loosened from doing that? So with the orbital, with the orbital atherectomy device, um, the particles are supposed to be so small that they would go all the way through the circulation until they get removed like other particulate in the liver. Um, 
That doesn't always happen, and so a lot of times what we will, use, we will do in combination with that, if, particularly if somebody has really bad downstream disease below the knee where they're not going to tolerate any embolic or, or, or debris going downstream, is we use a filter. And the filter that we use is actually the one we use for putting carotid stents in to, to, to catch any debris. So that we, do, we, have, we have options. If somebody's got wide open runoff below the knee, um, then the, the particulate debris does not cause problems. Um, but we do sometimes use filters. And I'm sorry, his question again was what, to, what happens to the debris that gets ground up or shaved off. Um, the second device you saw packs it, it, collects it and packs it into that nose cone. Any other questions about those devices? Yes, ma'am. What percentage of people get uh, dry tissue? Uh, I had a stent that stopped up in five months. Yes, ma'am. So, so how long ago was that? Last year. Uh, it, it only lasted. I had my uh, bypass in February, and then uh, in May, I had to go back and be re-stented. And this was in your legs or in your coronaries? Okay, so it's, it's different depending on where in the body you're talking about. The, the incidence of re-narrowing in the coronaries is actually very rare. That's fortunately with the current technology in, on the order of about 5%, um, depending on what kind of stents you get um, and the complexity of the case. So if you get multiple stents or if they're in a, put in in a tricky way, then it can be a little higher. So if you have two stents, your risk is a little bit higher of re-narrowing. For stents in the legs, it's actually a little bit higher, so it's probably... 20 or 30 percent chance that over the first year or two that it would re-narrow. Um, so again, that's why we try and save options. There's some people who tend to have more scar Absolutely. So it's, it's a very individualized thing. Her question was, do, do some people re-narrow stents more than others? And the answer is yes, that we ha all have, we have different uh, healing processes and tendencies towards scarring. Uh, just like people get keloids or excessive scars on their skin. Um, so yes, the answer is yes. We don't know exactly why or how to screen people to know if they're going to have excessive re-narrowing. Um, but uh, that's a great question. I had the angioplasty 20 years ago. Okay. And he said, well, then I believe we can correct it. I said, well, what would you do? So I'd put the balloon in tomorrow. I said, okay. He said, be here in the morning. Did it work out? He never had no problem. Yeah, there you go. So a lot of time, the majority of the time, 70 or 80% of the time, balloons and atherectomy without stents is all you need. Well, I went back and took a, a stress test. Everything was okay. Good. You had a great result. You must have had a good cardiologist. I hope it was me. In Rome, Georgia? Okay. Very good. So we talked about critical limb ischemia and those five Ps. We talk about what bad things can happen. When those wounds don't heal, they can become infected, and we start talking about things like amputation. And so a big part of what we do, and the reason why we tolerate or why we do procedures that don't have a 100% success rate is that we're trying to keep the arteries open even if it's just for long enough to heal, to avoid an amputation. Because then once the wound is dealt with, having a blockage may cause you some claudication or cause you some problems, but the goal in, that, in those situations uh, in terms of critical limb ischemia is to get you to heal and avoid an amputation. This is just an example of a severe blockage that we were able to get a wire across and angioplasty and allow for the wound to heal. So, so that's the spiel on peripheral arterial disease. So for a lot of you who aren't having claudication, don't have non-healing wounds, why should you want to know if you have peripheral arterial disease? The answer is what we're going to talk about next. There is a very close connection between heart disease and peripheral arterial disease. <clears throat> Atherosclerosis, what we were talking about before, that plaque buildup, that's a systemic disease. It doesn't generally just happen in one place. So if you've got coronary disease, you probably have at least to some degree peripheral arterial disease. And vice versa, if you've got claudication and blockage in your legs, you've probably got a little bit of carotid disease and a little bit of heart disease. Uh, so 
It's important to understand, it's important to know about because it gives you an idea about your long-term risk. You can see there's lots of overlap between lower extremity peripheral arterial disease, this is stroke and carotid disease, and coronary disease. We also know that if you have peripheral arterial disease, your risk of mortality is dramatically increased. And I don't say that to kind of scare you, I say that because we need to do something about it. And this is not, these people right down here who have the really low ABIs and they do poorly in terms of survival, it's not because their peripheral arterial disease jumps up on them and causes them to die. It's because they have heart attacks and strokes. And unfortunately, if we continue to think about peripheral arterial disease as uh, a disease of the legs, and all we have to do is try and get the legs to feel better and then send you on your way, we're doing you a major disservice. We're not, we're not reducing your long-term risk for stroke and heart attack. So this is an interesting case. This is a fellow who came to me for claudication, and we were actually able to do a little angioplasty on him and got him walking. And we followed him closely because we knew there's a chance it would come back, and we knew about his risk. So we see him back in the office three to six months later. His blood pressure is kind of hard to control. We kind of adjust his medications, and uh, we check his labs. He's having a little bit of progressive renal failure. So we make some more adjustments. Still can't get control of his blood pressure after two or three medicines. So we start saying, well, if you've got peripheral arterial disease, maybe you've got disease involving the kidney arteries as well. That's a different form of peripheral arterial disease. And in fact, he did. You can see right here, I hope, from the back, it's not very big, but there's about a 95% blockage right at the beginning of his renal artery. So the kidney is here. You have to kind of imagine this tree being the blood circulation to a kidney. It's his left kidney. This is all connected to arteries, the veins. The venous system is totally different. Yes, sir. It's, we don't generally get atherosclerosis in the venous wall because it's a totally different anatomy. The, 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 class, the cholesterol plaque and, and the inflammation that causes atherosclerosis generally happens on the arterial side, and that's probably because of the high pressure. Right? So the, the fast-moving blood causes shear stress, and the high pressure causes damage to the arterial wall and the lining. On the venous side, by the time you're coming back up, the pressure on the venous side is 15 millimeters of mercury. On the arterial side, if you have hypertension, it can be 150 millimeters, so 10 times more pressure on the arterial side. So, so yes, the question was, is this exclusively in the arteries, not the veins? And the answer is, is yes, this is a disease of the arteries. So in this case, because of the uncontrolled blood pressure and the progressive renal failure, um, we decided to fix that blockage. And so you see here, is, this is a wire and a stent going in. And the stent being expanded with, on the balloon. And we see the final result. So his kidney function stabilized. We were able to keep his medicines from continuing. Now, we did not get him off of medicine, so I'm not trying to tell you if you have high blood pressure, you can come off of medicines by getting your kidney artery stented. But in certain limited situations, it can be very beneficial. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question. It's not concerned of that because I don't have no problem with my leg. Okay. In 1992, I had open heart surgery. Yes, sir. And, and, uh, and I'm feeling fine from that. Good. About a year and a half ago, you put a stand in for me. Okay. And I'm doing good from that. All right, good. I've a problem that I want to ask you about. Okay. At night, these cover I put on me, you know, lately, a few years ago, I just do a lot of sweat, but I don't sweat in the daytime. Yeah. I have a lot of problems I have. I do, the least little cover I put on me, I sweat. <coughs> and I'm concerned about that. Is that related in a way to my heart? I don't think so. Um, you know, sweating can be a part of having a heart attack, but just kind of every night sweating when you put too many covers on. I have a heart attack. I don't have it, though. You've had the survival test. <laughs> I, I don't know what to tell you about that one. You might want to go and get some lab work done or something looking for something other than your heart. I don't think that's your heart. Nocturnal cramps, that's a real confounder. That's a hard one uh, to answer. He, he asked, how about not, nighttime cramping? Nighttime cramping can be a, a symptom of peripheral arterial disease 
frequently is not. Um, so nocturnal cramping is a problem that's very vexing and, and challenging because there's no good treatments for it and it's very, very common. So it, what I tell folks is if you have nocturnal cramping, then let's, let's do an ABI on you. It's cheap, easy, non-invasive, and, and just make sure it's not a circulatory problem. I would also ask you, well, if you have nighttime cramping, do you have cramping in your legs when you walk? If you really have no symptoms when you walk and it's just when, you, when you're laying in bed, then it's probably not vascular. Just laying in bed. Yeah, it, it probably is just run-of-the-mill nocturnal cramps, and there's not a great solution for that. Potassium Yes, ma'am. Yes, my feet burn under the bottom. I'm not a diabetic, and so I was concerned about that. But if under the bottom of my feet burns. Yes, ma'am. Then on top of that, my ankles be puffed and swollen about all the time. Yeah. One of my legs is larger than the other. You, need, you definitely need to go to the doctor. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, I, what you're describing is a lot of different things, and, and, and some of them could be related to circulation, for sure. Um, she has a question on neuropathy. Okay. Uh, you want to ask yeah, her? Uh, yeah, okay. She has neuropathy real bad. Okay. Is there any help for it? Why couldn't they clean my arteries out like they did with that? So, so neuropathy is like nocturnal cramps. There's lots of things that cause neuropathy. Neuropathy is uh, by definition it means there's a problem with the nerves that can be because of blockage in your legs but it can also be because the high blood sugars have kind of destroyed the small nerves it can also be from a variety of other esoteric things that are very hard to identify so the answer is if you have neuropathy but none of the other stuff that i've talked about chances are good it's not vascular but it is certainly reasonable to have an abi test done as part of the workup of Neuropathy, ABI. an ABI test or a circulation test. You can talk to your family well, doctor. Yes, did. The doctor told me, and the blood doesn't circulate. The blood doesn't come off. Right. So I, I think it, that sounds like you need to either be referred to a vascular specialist, an interventional cardiologist, or a vascular interventionist, or a vascular surgeon, um, or have your primary care doctor order some vascular studies. But but no, I think those sound like reasonably good symptoms to work up. I, I have a question to ask you because he says. Something when she went to Dr. Boo said something about flaps. What's flaps? Well, the flaps in my feet are sending the good blood up. Oh yeah, the, so the so that's a venous. That's a that's that's a question that you need to bring back to the venous talk, because that's a vein problem issue. So the valves of the veins don't work. So that's not an arterial problem though, and there's not a great fix for that one either, unfortunately. No, ma'am. Okay. No, sir. Thank you, Frederick. You're welcome. Thank you, Frederick. All right, one more question. Oh, um, that's going to be a question I'm going to have to leave up to your pain, doctor. I really have. Yeah, there's a lot of medicines. There's a, there's, there's a lot of new medicines out for, for neuropathy of all kinds. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I, it's, that's an individualized thing. Yeah. Right. I, you know, there's no specific reason from a heart standpoint, but, but you really, you know, you need to make sure you're talking to all your doctors, including your family doctor. Um, so, again, knowing, knowing that you have peripheral arterial disease is, uh, is half the battle. And that's because early recognition allows for early intervention. And I don't mean angioplasty or atherectomy or doing procedures. I mean in medicines and, and screening and things like that. And then risk reduction. So... If you've got those symptoms, I would recommend that you get tested. You can get ABIs ordered by your family doctor. You can ask him to refer you to a vascular specialist or cardiologist. You can, um, you can come to one of the free screenings that the hospital puts on, particularly if you don't have symptoms. That, that's kind of for more for people who don't have symptoms. If you do have symptoms, I would, I would recommend that you get formally tested, um, not through the vascular screening. If you also, if you, if you have peripheral arterial disease, you need to be aware of and report any symptoms that might be suggestive of heart problems, like angina or chest pain, shortness of breath, stroke symptoms like numbness or weakness of an arm or leg, slurred speech. 
I want you to walk as much as possible. Walking helps develop what we call collaterals. You grow new blood vessels that reroute blood circulation around blockages. So we want you to walk as much as possible. Maintaining the functional status is critically important to your long-term heart health. So, and then the last thing we're going to talk about tonight is identifying and adjusting risk factors that contribute to progression of atherosclerosis all over your body, in your heart, in your carotid arteries. Um, so let's talk about that. I want you to know your numbers. So if you guys could just memorize this chart real quick. This is how cholesterol is processed in your body. If you do this, you'll be able to then talk, you know, speak intelligently with your doctor when he's trying to convince you to take a statin. <coughs> It's enough to make your head spin. So I want you to just think about two numbers, HDL and LDL, OK? The good guy and the bad guy. The HDL helps your body circulate cholesterol out into, you know, to your liver and get the, get the cholesterol removed instead of depositing in the artery wall. The LDL cholesterol is the big culprit. That's the one that really leads to plaque formation. So specifically, we're going to look at that LDL number. We want it to be less than 100. Now, I, that's, a, that's a loose recommendation. If you have diabetes, if you have peripheral arterial disease formally diagnosed, or coronary disease, you need to have less than 70. That is almost impossible to do without medicine. And even sometimes with medicine, it's hard to do. So um, know that. Blood pressure. Blood pressure is a hard one because a lot of blood pressures have medicines have side effects and people don't like taking blood pressure medicine. But you need to realize that there's a direct relationship between lethal cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes and how well your blood pressure is controlled. We kind of talk about three stages of blood pressure. Prehypertension is when you're just under 140 over 90. In those situations, that's the rare situation where we kind of say, well, let's reduce your salt. Let's increase your, your activity level some. Try and eat a little better, you know, do some lifestyle modification. Once you get up over that level, though, you're going to need medicine. And we start medicines at that therapy, I mean, that, um, at that level. If you have really high blood pressure and you come in, your blood pressure is 160 or 170, over 100, mm -hmm. go ahead and start preparing yourself psychologically. The likelihood is, statistically speaking, you're going to need at least two agents. Okay? People have an obsession with the number of pills that they're on. So I'm just telling you, you're going to need two or three medicines if you have that kind of high blood pressure. And we've got to just find a regimen that works for you. My son has a lot wrong. He has, he's 45, has fibromyalgia and rheumatoid arthritis. And his blood pressure consistently runs 190 up to the top. Now I can't remember what the bottom, the bottom one is. But his doctor says it's causing pain. It doesn't give him any pills. Shouldn't he have them? Well, uh, the pain definitely drives blood pressure, for sure. So I, I can't speak to that having never seen him, but I know I would say it's not acceptable for him to walk around with a blood pressure of 190 all the time. So either the pain has to be addressed or we have to do, you know, do both. Um, so um, I'm happy to report smoking is on the decline. This is, again, is a smoker's disease. Atherosclerosis is a smoker's disease, and it will, no matter how much cholesterol medicine you take, or how much fiber you eat, no matter how far you walk, if you smoke, your peripheral arterial disease and your coronary disease will get worse over time. So you, if, you're a smoke, if you're a smoker, you have to stop smoking. It's absolutely mandatory. So we'll kind of wrap things up. Leg pain is not just part of getting older. That's one of the, 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 the big limitations that we have is convincing our, our community and our primary care doctors that that leg pain is not just getting old. The problem is almost everybody, once you get to a certain age, has leg pain of some sort. And so it can be overwhelming, you know, on the front lines in the primary care offices when folks come in with leg pain. But leg pain is not part of getting older. You need to get a diagnosis. Is it arthritis? Is it neuropathy? Is it peripheral arterial disease? So get, get it evaluated. PAD is common and it's frequently underdiagnosed. <coughs> We have minimally invasive procedures like the ABIs and CT scans um, that are uh, available to, tr um, uh, that we, I'm sorry, we have minimally invasive procedures that are available to treat blockage and try and relieve symptoms um, and reduce your risk of amputation. You need to realize that statistically speaking, if you've got a blockage in your leg, you have the same risk of dying of heart attack as someone who has already had a heart attack. 
Okay, so it is, it is a disease equivalent. The good news is that long-term risk can be modified uh, with um, some of the things we talked about. Was there a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, and, uh, with us sitting down all the time, do we, are we at greater risk? Sedentary lifestyle is absolutely a, a risk factor. And so we really encourage folks that have sitting jobs, sedentary jobs, to walk before work, to walk at lunch, to walk after work, um, to get up and periodically going to make a lap around the office, um, to do some calf raises or whatever you got to do to kind of to, to, reduce, to reduce that sedentary aspect of your life. One of the great things they've come out with now are these pedometers that you can wear, and you can get them to where they just count your steps, and they're 10 bucks, or you can kind of get a $100 one that'll talk to your iPhone and tell you, you know, how many miles you've walked in the week. And so I would encourage all of you to do whatever you got to do to get active. So being active is huge. Final recommendation. Oh, did you have a question? I had a couple. One was, is there a genetic uh, connection for periphery artery disease? Absolutely. It's the same genetic pro, you know, predisposition that, that heart disease and stroke has. So absolutely, for some reason, um, <coughs> genetically, some people are predisposed to deposit cholesterol in the arterial wall more than others. And we all know people who smoked and smoked till they're 100 years old. Like my grandfather smoked two to three packs a day and ate steak three nights a week. And he's 90. And he's had bypass surgery and some other stuff. But so, some people have protective genes that just allow them to make bad choices. And other people have genes such that if they smoke when they're 40, they're going to have a, a lethal heart attack. So, so the answer is yes, it's the same systemic disease. Another question, you mentioned the patient that had the problem with the artery <coughs> in his kidney. Are there any symptoms of that that you can... So that's pretty uncommon, um, and, and I don't want everybody to leave here and go, something wrong with my kidney arteries. The, there is no symptoms to it. It generally presents as uncontrolled hypertension and blood pressure and, 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 and early renal failure. So um, there are no kind of outward symptoms other than that. Um, so final recommendations. If you've got leg pain or other PAD, symptoms, make an appointment, get referred, get tested. If you're currently asymptomatic, the hospital puts on periodic free screenings. And I think that's a great thing. If you've got risk factors but no symptoms, go down there and they can do a quick ABI on you. It's not exactly the same kind we would do in the office, but it's a great screening test. And if you're otherwise not being treated aggressively for blood pressure and cholesterol, that would give you and your doctor a good motivation to kind of treat you in a more aggressive preventative fashion. That's all I got. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry? So, so claudication, the classic claudication is, Doc, every time I walk outside my house to go to my mailbox, I get about 10 yards down, and it starts burning in my calves. And if I keep going, it kind of come, gets to where it's in my thighs too some. And then I stop, and if I just stand there, it'll get better. Uh, or if I sit down, it'll get better. And then I start walking again. And it comes back. That's claudication. You get ABIs and get an angiogram and see if there's a blockage we can fix. You can come see me. There's, there's, we have great surgeons and great interventional radiologists, but you just ask your primary care doctor to send you. Yes? Yes, sir. Um, and they put dye in my blood. Why do I fall out? Uh, that's, a, that's a hard one. I'm not. <laughs> uh, I, think I went to my doctor, my primary doctor. They can't give me an answer. Yeah, so he said he, he has, he quote, falls out when he gets dye in his arteries. And I, that may be an allergy. The people have contrast allergies, so that's, that's the only thing I can think of off the top of my head. But you might want to talk to somebody about that. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Do you think that they will ever come up with a solution for a large heart? Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, we have we have medicines for that. So the answer question was enlarged heart. Is there a treatment for that? And the answer is yes. We have medicines and procedures that can address that. Okay. I have leg pains. Yes, ma'am. Real bad. Okay. And then I have this. They move. 
you know, and I'm not even conscious of it when it starts. Yeah. But I pay attention, you know, and just, they just move. Okay, so she says she has leg pain and her legs, they move on their own. They kind of wiggle around and she can't really control it, doesn't really know why it's happening. That's probably restless leg syndrome, which has a lot of overlap with peripheral disease, um, but is not, it's not a vascular problem. But a lot of people confuse those two things um, because the, sim the symptoms can be similar. How does alcohol consumption affect peripheral The question is, how does alcohol consumption affect peripheral disease? Uh, probably indirectly, the main thing that alcohol is going to do is going to make it harder for your doctor to control your blood pressure. So having high blood pressure, again, increases the progression of atherosclerosis and probably contributes to progressive peripheral disease in that way. That's the main thing I think alcohol contributes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I have PAD. Okay. And uh, I usually walk two miles a day. And I got to where I couldn't walk a quarter of a mile without stopping several times. And it was like my calves and my legs were being grabbed. Yes, ma'am. And as soon as I'd stop, the pain would stop. That's classic claudication. Did you get, did you get treated? Yes, sir. And it's better? Yes, sir. Good. Yeah, it can, we can, it, the, there's, there's two people that I really enjoy, take, two types of patients I really enjoy taking care of because they're the most appreciative patients. Obviously, when somebody has a heart attack and you save their life, they tend to be fairly appreciative. <laughs> the other one is somebody who's got terrible claudication and they can't walk to their car without excruciating pain and you do an angioplasty on them and they're back to their normal lives. They, they are almost equally as appreciative as somebody who's, who's had a heart attack. So it's a real rewarding disease to treat because people really suffer with it and they can, they can get a lot of relief with some of the treatments we have. Sometimes medicine, sometimes a procedure. And I was, I'm told, walk, walk, walk. That's absolutely the, the mantra. Words, That's right. She says she was told to walk, 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 and that is 100% the case. A lot of times we'll try walking therapy first, where you walk till it hurts, rest, walk till it hurts, rest, and you can stimulate collaterals and better blood flow that way. Any, yes, ma'am. So, so one. So the question is, what about the bur the burning on the bottom of the feet? We've kind of talked about neuropathy, and one of the causes of neuropathy besides diabetes is peripheral arterial disease. So, that's one of them. There's a lot of other ones that are pretty uncommon, but they can. There's other causes. So, just because you have neuropathy does not mean you have PAD, but you, you should probably be at least tested at least once to make sure. Okay. I got one point. Okay, just one. Yeah. Okay. I have the tingling and burning in my feet. Uh huh. Then I had that PAD. Yes. You had burning after? Yeah. A after you got PAD? Yeah. Yeah, PAD can cause neuropathy. Uh -huh. If it, yeah, so it's one of the reasons why we want to catch it early. And I treat it. Daniel's yet. What's that? <laughs> He's the one that's done it. Oh, is that right? You had some burning after a procedure? Yeah. Yeah, definitely talk to him about that. That's not my bag. <laughs> what else? Are we about out of time? Are we time for it? Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sizemore. You're welcome.